Good morning. It is good to be here today, and it's good to see you here today. I'm so glad that you've been able to, uh, how do I say this? I'm so glad that you've just made the choice to be here today, to, to get out on a beautiful day, to, uh, to, to recognize the need for being here with a group of believers, here with brothers and sisters in Christ, here in a place where we are strengthened, where we are, are equipped, where we are prepared to be sent out into the world. What, what a great opportunity we have today as we join together here in this place. Uh, before we get started with our, the rest of our service, we do have some announcements. Uh, I, a quick question, who knows, just by a, a show of hand, who knows where our offering basket is? Yes! Absolutely, absolutely. I love the fact that Knox even goes, it's right back there. It's back there, Pastor Jerry. That's where it is. There it is. I, seriously, though, I, I, I do want to, and I know I say this often, but I continue to be so amazed by your uh, support, by your generosity, uh, because of your giving, because of your continued giving through all the stuff that we've been through for the last two years. Our support for our missionaries uh, overseas, our support for ministries that are going, in, going on in our local community, none of that has faltered. Uh, I've talked to many other pastors, many other uh, uh, groups, and they say the same thing. Oh, man, I don't know how you're doing it. I don't know how all of your things are, 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 are being paid for. I don't know how your stuff is, is getting done. And uh, my continued answer is our folks. God has laid that need upon the hearts of our people, and our people continue to respond to God's call. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the ways that you continue to give. What a blessing. Uh, our Trail Life uh, boys, our American Heritage girls, uh, continue to be key ministries. One of the things that, that we've discovered this past year is that these two troops, these two groups are key ministry of our local church, and they need our support. I put out a plea a few weeks ago, especially for the American Heritage Girls Troop, that uh, they stand in need of some adult leadership over this next year. Uh, God has answered that prayer. Uh, there are some folks who have stepped into various roles, but there's still a need. If God has been dealing with you about something in regards to that, please, please, please let me know. Uh, we, they, both of these troops are finishing up next week. Uh, next Sunday, May 22nd, uh, they're having their end-of-year awards ceremony. Uh, the girls will be here at 2 o'clock, the boys at 3.30. They'll be finishing things up, getting things done. Uh, it would be a fabulous time. If you have, if you have opportunity next Sunday, more, uh, next Sunday afternoon uh, to come up and to see what goes on at American Heritage Girls and at Trail Life, uh, you would be blown away by these, by these young people and by the folks who come in and support them. Uh, we continue to need these two troops, and they continue to need us as we join together, as we minister together. Our discipleship study meets on Wednesdays, uh, 7 p.m., right back there. You're invited to join us here at the church or through the Zoom meeting that's provided, and either one of those options is available. We have folks who join on Zoom uh, almost every week, and we still have a group of folks uh, who are coming together in person on Wednesday night. If you've gotten out of the habit, uh, I encourage you, come. Come on Wednesday nights. The discussion is, uh, is usually, usually good. It's usually good. Yeah, yeah. It would be better if you were here. See what I did there? You see what happened? You like that? Yeah. Uh, baccalaureate. Robinson High School Baccalaureate is next Sunday. Uh, this has been for years in the cafetorium. Uh, that's where I had baccalaureate. That's where I graduated from high school. Uh, I'm still a little bitter about having to graduate from high school in the same place that I ate lunch every day, but I've somehow, after 35 years, gotten over it. Um, pray for me. <laughs> baccalaureate is next Sunday at Meadowbrook Baptist Church, right up Old Robinson Road here from us, across the across old uh, across uh, Loop 340 up there. Uh, if a plea has gone out from Meadowbrook Baptist. If anyone would like to bake cookies and uh, take them up there, let me know so I can let uh, their pastor know and, and uh, we can get things done for that. 
Uh, we do have a few folks, a couple of folks actually. I had a, an invitation this past week from Zane Monger, that's Ann's uh, grandson, and was handed an invitation this morning that's going to go up on our bulletin board from the K's. That's Carter Cheek. Well, you can't see him there. That's Carter Cheek. You probably still can't see him. If you're on Facebook, you're looking at him right there. You, but you already know him because Carter's probably all over Facebook. So there you go. Carter graduates uh, next week. Is that right? The 28th. The 28th. The 28th. There you go. There's going to be a mule rider. There's going to be a mule rider. That's not a job. That's actually the school that he's going to. Yes, and he's going to run track. No one is surprised by that. that. That boy can run. I don't know. Where did he get that from, Mark? Yeah. <laughs> we'll go with got it from your dad. Yeah, I heard stories. Absolutely. So this is going to be up on the board. Please, 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 if you can, um, let Carter know how proud of him you are. And the same with Zane. If you'll let Zane know how proud you are of the achievements that, that both of these young men have achieved, just uh, simply pass that along to them. Uh, and speaking of graduates, uh, our own Ruslan, uh, the young man who was here uh, playing for us uh, two pianists ago, uh, before Linda, before Josh, we had Ruslan. Some of you have never seen Ruslan. Uh, Ruslan was an amazing young man, still is an amazing young man, except now he's Dr. Ruslan Bayazitov. Bayazitov, there we go. I practiced that, I promise. Ruslan's commencement exercises were this past Friday at the University of Houston, and we are very proud of this young man. What a blessing he was, and still is. Uh, camp is coming up quickly, June 5th through 11th at Sandy Creek Bible Camp, and as you have no doubt figured out, it is live and in person again this year. No more virtual camp, please, Lord, ever again. There are no paper camp forums. This is what I'm being told. Is that correct? There are no paper camp forms. That means we don't have to print off 1,800 pages of paper. We don't have to keep up with all of these things for the week. They're all going to be online, on a place where they can be accessed, on a folder, on a computer, done. Uh, but to that end, you need to know where that is. And it is, oh, can you go back one? Oh, it's not up there. Oops, sorry. Uh, I, I'll give you the, the address real quick. It's uh, uh, docs.google.com slash forms slash D slash E one capital F capital A. Would it be better if I just gave this to you after the service? It's there. So there you go. If you're not writing it down right now, get it. If you need a camp form, the best way to get it is to go to. is to go to our webpage, BethelMethodist.com slash Robinson. It's all the, the forms are there. Everything is right there. I just look for the big button that says Youth, and you'll find it all right there. You can always keep in touch with stuff going on, and not only in our local church, but across the denomination at BethelMethodist.com. As we go to worship this morning, as we get announcements out of the way, uh, you know, announcements are one of those blessings and 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 also annoyances that I have to deal with every week. Uh, but at the same time, it, it's a good reminder of the fact that our church is more than just what happens right here for an hour on Sunday morning. Our church is beyond the four walls of this building. We have influence and impact because God is directing us, God is empowering us, God is equipping us. We have influence and impact in our community and beyond our community. Every single day of the week, we have opportunity in some way, shape, or form to have an influence and an impact. Um, that's the empowerment that God gives us, not for the glory of, of Bethel Methodist, not for the glory of, of your pastor, but for the glory of God for the glory and the furtherment of his kingdom. What a blessing it is to be reminded of these things that God has called us to be involved in. We turn our attention this morning to the scriptures. We start Psalm 148. Listen. Listen to the words of the psalmist. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. 
Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you stars of light. Praise him, you heavens of heavens, and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded, and they were created. He also established them forever and ever. He made a decree which shall not pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures in all the depths, fire and hail, snow and clouds, stormy wind, fulfilling his word, mountains and all hills, fruitful trees and all cedars, beasts and all cattle, creeping things and flying fowl, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all judges of the earth, both young men and maidens, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His glory is above the earth and heaven, and he has exalted the horn of his people, the praise of all his saints, of the children of Israel, a people near to him. Praise the Lord. Let us pray. Father, this morning as we read from the Psalms, as we begin our service, the, what the psalmist write, re, writes reminds me, Lord God, of the time before creation groaned, of the time before sin entered into and, and, and stained and twisted and turned upside down your creation. What we're reminded of, Lord God, is the fact that you have created, that you are sustaining, that you are God Almighty. Father, we look at the world today and we're, we're confounded by how folks can, can just absolutely choose evil over good. How they can reject good and call good evil. Father, we're confounded by that. But yet, your word reminds us that this is what happens. This is what happens in a world that has turned its eyes away from you. This is what happens, Lord God, when your people have turned their eyes away from you. And so, Father, today we admit that there are times, there are things that we have placed above you. Father, forgive us. Lord God, Lord God, forgive us. Help us, Father, to love you more than anything else in this world. Help us, Lord God, this day. To set aside those things which so easily distract, so easily ensnare us. Help us, Lord God, to again set, be set on your path. May your Holy Spirit today, Lord God, may your Holy Spirit today help us by equipping us, by strengthening us, by confronting us when necessary. Make us, Lord God, your people. In all that we do, Lord God, may you be glorified. All this we pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Good morning. Let's stand together. We're going to sing hymn number 444. I love to tell the story, and then we'll go right into the doxology. We miss it. It's meaningful. We need to do it again. story of unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory, of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story because I know it is true. It satisfies my longings as nothing else can tell the story will be my theme in glory to tell the old old story of Jesus and his love I love to tell a story most wonderful in praise and all the golden fancies of all the golden I love to tell the story it did so much for me and that is just the reason I tell it now to thee I love to tell the story twill be my theme in glory to tell the old 
seems each time I tell it more wonderfully sweet. I love to tell the story, for some have never heard the message of salvation from God's own holy word. I love to tell the story, will be my theme in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. I love to tell a story for those who know it best. Seem hungering and thirsting to hear it like the rest. And when the scenes of glory I sing the new, new song. Twill be the old, old story that I have loved so long. I love to tell the story. Twill be my theme in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. John 13, 31 through 35. So, when he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and glorify him immediately. Little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me, and as I said to the Jews, where I am going, you cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Let's sing hymn number 424, the, the servant song. No, let's sing Bind Us Together. Bind us together and bless be the tie that binds me. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together, Lord, bind us together with love. There is only one God. together with cords that cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together, Lord, bind us together with love. Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. A fellowship of kindred minds is like to that above. Before our Father's throne, we pour our ardent prayers, our fears, 
our hopes, our aims are one. Our comforts and our cares, when we asunder part, it gives us inward pain. But we shall still be joined in heart and hope to. Let's, join to, let's remain standing and we'll join together for the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is sitting at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And from there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the one universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. As we go to prayer this morning, there are a uh, uh, just a, a brief update that I want to give you on Ed and Sherlon. Uh, Sherlon has been in the hospital for a good part of this week. Uh, she is, as long as nothing's changed, hopefully she's coming home today, and that is uh, definitely an answer. Uh, she has been dealing with some pneumonia and some other uh, issues that have, uh, that have crept up, so uh, certainly continue to pray for Sherlon. Uh, in the meantime, now Ed's sick. So uh, Ed called me yesterday, and he said, So Sherlock's coming home tomorrow, but now I'm sick. And I said, Oh, you poor man. So not only this morning are we grateful and praying for Sherlock, we're also praying for Ed. And please pray for Amy. Amy, their daughter, just absolutely gets to take care of both Ed and Sherlock. And uh, Amy, we were praying uh for this morning as well as for her parents. So uh, there you go. I know we have other needs. I know that we have other, other uh, uh, issues and things among us. I know that. I'm aware of, of many of those. And if I'm not, God certainly is. Uh, we do have some folks traveling this morning. We continue to, to pray for those who are traveling. We continue to pray for, uh, for Bede as, his, as he's getting his strength back and, and hopefully, prayerfully, we'll be able to be back with us in service uh, shortly. What a blessing it is to know that we, we who are needy, we who are, are, are weak, we who stand in daily need of God's grace, we are able to go before God, to, to take our needs before the very throne of heaven. What an incredible opportunity. What an incredible thing that the God of the universe knows us, knows our name. Knows our issues, knows our fears, knows our joys. What an incredible thing that God loves us. That God calls us to be in relationship with him. And that right now, he invites us to come before his throne, to bring our praises, and to bring our needs. Let's pray. Father, we do indeed come before you. We recognize, Lord God, that you are God. And we admit, Father, that too often we forget that. Forgive us, Father. Help us in every way possible, Lord God, to remember, to recognize, to live our lives in such a way that you, Father, are seen and known through us. Father, through our words, through our actions, through all that we do, 
Help us, Father, to live as your followers, to live as your people. We pray, Father, for these needs today that we've mentioned. Lord, we specifically lift up to you, Ed and Sherlon. We pray, Father, that you will continue to touch and heal and bring them back uh, to, to full health and strength. And we pray, Father, for Amy. This has not only been a difficult week for her uh, with her parents both being sick, but now, Father, with the other things going on in her life as well, we pray that you will, that you will help her this week, that you will give her the strength that she needs, that you will continually, Father, draw her close to you, help her to know, Lord God, that you are with her. We pray, Father, for the other needs that are represented by, by each family who's here this morning. Father, you know our needs. You know our fears. You know our pains. You know our, our joys. You know, Father, our griefs and our sorrows. You know the struggles that we face every day. And many of us, Lord God, face those struggles. Some are physical. Some are emotional. But, Father, you know those struggles. We pray, Father, for your strength. We ask, Lord God, that you will continually, continually, Lord God, be that rock, that, that firm foundation upon which our lives are built so that those things that come, that come our way, those, those struggles that we face, even those pitfalls and those traps that, that the deceiver throws, in our, throws in, our, in our path, Lord God, that you are able to overcome all of those things, that you, Lord God, are able to keep that pathway in which we walk straight and narrow. Fix our eyes upon you, Father. Help us in all that we do, Lord God, to hear and to recognize that you, who have begun a good work in us, will continue, Lord God, to complete that work for your glory and not for our own. Hear us now as we join our hearts and our voices together, praying as Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I said at the beginning with the first scripture reading from, from the Psalms that it was an echo in there of creation before creation was groaning for God to redeem it and to set it free from the bondage of sin. I want you now to hear from the Revelation, Revelation chapter 21. This is creation set free. This is sin once and forever done away with. John writes, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven, the first earth, had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. We talked Wednesday night about the imagery of the sea being chaos, being that which is feared and fearful. Imagine that. All of the chaos is stilled. Everything fearful is gone. Then I, John, saw the new, the new city, I'm sorry, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he said, "Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely. To him who thirsts. Let's stand and sing again. <coughs> sing him one, 105. We will glorify. <coughs> we 
We will glorify the King of kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of lords, who is the great I Am. Lord of Jehovah reigns in majesty. We will now before His throne. We will worship Him in righteousness. We will worship Him alone. He is Lord of heaven, Lord of earth. He is Lord of all who live. He is the Lord of the universe. All praise to Him we give. Hallelujah to the King of kings. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah to the Lord of lords, who is the great I Am. Amen. You can be seated. We have, for the last several weeks, been going through the book of Acts, and as we've done so, we've noticed these different aspects of being a witness, of, of how God is working in the early church to uh, maintain, to, to send out, to encourage, to strengthen, to help these who are God's witnesses. We see today in Acts chapter 11, a witness defended. We'll talk more about that as we go. Not long ago, a situation occurred that was brought back to my mind as, uh, as this passage of Scripture was read this week. Uh, here's, here's what happened. Maybe, maybe you can relate. I'm not sure. While trying to sign in, to a website that's, that's really, honestly, used almost weekly. There was this message that kept popping up. Wrong password, wrong user ID. Something was wrong. Immediately, it had to be that someone changed my password. Some force outside of myself must have changed my password. So, people were contacted. Assurances were given. No changes had been made. So I went back, and I typed it again. And I realized that my caps lock button was on. And so everything that I was typing in was in capital letters. The fault was not the outside mysterious force that somehow changed my password. The fault was with me. Now, we've all heard that the most exercise that many people get is jumping to conclusions. It's an old joke, but it's a joke that still has some truth to it. How quickly we jump to conclusions regarding situations that we experience or people we meet. And often, when the facts have all been gathered, the conclusions to which we jump prove to be absolutely wrong. Our scripture text for today shows that we're not alone in making these conclusions, in jumping to these conclusions too quickly and setting ourselves up in a situation that absolutely God has to correct and fix. Let's read through the whole passage. It's big, but bear with me. Let's read together. Uh, Acts chapter 11, starting in verse 1. Now the apostles and the brethren who are in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. When Peter came up to Jerusalem, those of the circumcision contended with him, saying, You went into uncircumcised men and ate with them. Peter explained it to them in order from the beginning, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying. In a trance I saw a vision, an object descending like a great sheet 
let down from heaven by four corners. And it came to me. When I observed it intently and considered, I saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, birds of the air. And I heard a voice say to me, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, Not so, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has at any time entered my mouth. But the voice answered me again from heaven, What God has cleansed, you must not call common. Now this was done three times, and all was drawn up again into heaven. At that very moment, three men stood before the house where I was, having been sent to me from Caesarea, and the Spirit told me to go with them, doubting nothing. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me. We entered the man's house, and he told us how he had seen an angel standing in his house, who said to him, Send men to Joppa. Call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who will tell you words by which you and all your household will be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, as upon us at the beginning. Then I remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If, therefore, God gave them the same gift as he gave us when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could withstand God? When they heard these things, they became silent, and they glorified God, saying, Then God also has granted to the Gentiles repentance of life. There are some folks who really don't like this passage of Scripture, some scholars who really don't like this passage of Scripture. The reason is, they say, God is seen in this passage as having everything already established. There's no room for human uh, for human interaction, there's no room for choice, there's no room for a response on the part of, of, of humanity. I'm not sure that's right. When, when we go back and we read this passage again, and we look at, at all of it, we look at, at the whole thing, we remember and we recognize here that, that yes, God did reveal a, a, a miraculous, spectacular vision to Peter as he was in prayer, as he was, as he was preparing for, for what was coming next. God revealed something to him. And so, first of all, first of all, Peter was making himself available to God, to work in, to use. By submitting himself to God in prayer, there was already an attitude in Peter's heart. God, whatever it is, wherever it is, use me. Send me. Correct me if necessary. That's our attitude when we come to God. People say all the time, oh, preacher, just pray a little prayer and let's get on with what we need to do. <sighs> How can we pray a little prayer when we are entering into the very presence of God? God Almighty, when we are, are bowing our hearts, our lives before Him, that's not a little thing. That's not a little thing, ever. Peter was bowing himself before God, and God was working in that moment. And Peter was responding. He was confused by what he saw, but he was responding. Because when the people came to take him to where he needed to go, Peter said, okay, I guess this is where God needs to send me. That's only half the story. The other half of the story is what's going on, what God is doing over at Cornelius' house. And this is all back in chapter 10 of Acts. This is a chapter back. We're, just, we're, we're rewinding and remembering a little bit this morning. Just a chapter back over at Cornelius' house. Cornelius is in prayer. Again, humbling himself before God. Cornelius. Cornelius the Roman soldier, Cornelius the Roman centurion, the, if we wanted to say it in a certain way that, that might communicate, the captain of those other soldiers. This was a man who, by law, by Roman law, was required to worship 
the emperor and to recognize that the emperor was God and that anything that the emperor said was absolutely to be done immediately. And here's Cornelius bowing his head, his heart, his life before the one true living God, before the holy God of Israel. And the holy God of Israel working in Cornelius' life and in his heart and saying, go get Simon. He's in Joppa. He's at the house of the tanner named Simon. Go get him. Go get Simon Peter. And so Cornelius does, because that's what, that's what a soldier does. He hears the orders of his superior and he acts upon those orders. And that's what Cornelius does. He recognizes that God is his superior. And he hears the voice of God. And he acts upon that voice. And he sins for Simon. We don't see what's going on. We see God at work in Simon's household. In, uh, in, in Simon Peter's life, we see God at work in Cornelius' household. But we don't see the whole picture until both of these men respond in faith to what God tells them to do, and to go where God tells them to go. They are given a tiny, tiny little piece of the picture. And it's not until they respond and they come together that God reveals what God needs them to see. And what God reveals <laughs> is more than anyone ever believed was possible. That's our rewind. That's our, our rehash of what happened in chapter 10. Now in chapter 11, word has gotten back to Jerusalem. Word got back to Jerusalem before Peter got back to Jerusalem. Word got back that Peter had been in the household of a Gentile. Ugh. Not just any Gentile, but a Roman soldier. Ugh. These are the guys who commonly, commonly, were, were seen as the insurgent enemy. These were the guys. This was the living embodiment of the evil of the Roman Empire. Peter went into this man's house, banned under Jewish law, not to be done. And hearing this news, the Jerusalem church leaders jumped to a conclusion that would later prove to be wrong. On first glance, as we read through chapter 11, it's easy to think that the conclusion that, was, that they jumped to was that Peter was guilty of transgressing the moral law of God. This moral law of God, we find it throughout the Old Testament, but especially in the book of Leviticus, and especially in Leviticus 19, this is where we find all of those weird and odd instructions like don't wear clothes that's knitted of or that, that's that's made of more than one fiber. Don't plant more than one thing in your garden. Don't uh, don't cook uh, a goat in a baby goat in its mother's milk. To this day, that's why eating a cheeseburger is not kosher. That's not a joke. That's, that's a true thing. You cannot, you cannot get a cheeseburger in the McDonald's in, uh, in Jerusalem. Is this, I am not making that up. That is a true story. True story. Now, all of these rules seem so weird and so foreign, but it's God's way of keeping his people morally free. Of, of being separated, of reminding his people that these are God's people. These are not the Roman Empire's people. These are not their own people. These are God's people. And God's people are to be set apart. They are to be, the word that we usually use is sanctified. They are to be morally free from the pollution of sinfulness. Now, if these laws seem strange and strict, we have to remember that Vacation Bible School song that we've grown up hearing and teaching to our children and grandchildren. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. That's good advice, isn't it? Oh, be careful, little ears, what you hear. For the Father up above is looking down in love. 
go be careful, little feet, where you go. And I just realized I combined three verses in one verse. But you get the point. That's moral instruction. That's moral instruction that's given to our children to remind them that as a follower of Jesus Christ, they are to live in a way that is different from the way the world from the way the world lives. Sorry, that was <clears throat> too many words at one time. The protection that God had given to the Jewish people through the moral law, through the moral code, through the Torah. It was a primary concern, especially for these leaders in Jerusalem, that that God would continue to make his will clear through the writings of the law and the prophets. And so the leaders jumped to a conclusion. They jumped to the conclusion that Peter was guilty. Because they had already jumped to another conclusion, but we'll get to that in a minute. There was this erroneous conclusion then. They had arrived at this. They had already found Peter guilty before they had even heard the story. We must not fall into that same trap. And so today, as we break this section down into three parts, my prayer is that as we look at this passage in smaller chunks, that we will hear as God speaks to us and recognize what God is telling us as we again go back and look at these three parts. We start with, first of all, verses 1 through 3, the accusation. Listen again. Now the apostles and the brethren who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter came up to Jerusalem, those of the circumcision contended with him, saying, you went into the house of an uncircumcised man and you ate with him. The accusation was there. The accusation stood before Peter when he arrived in Jerusalem. The accusation is valid. Based upon what the Old Testament moral laws taught, yes, absolutely, Peter was guilty. Everything that they said was true. That's right. I preached the gospel to Gentiles. I went to a Gentile's house, it didn't say anything about sharing a meal, but it's understood that if you go into a person's house, that that person is going to, out of the, the hospitality rules of the day and of the culture, that person is going to extend to you a meal. It's easy, in our view, 21 centuries later, it's easy to just simply kick the Jewish leaders to the curb for their lack of love, for their cultural insensitivity toward this toward this Gentile. But consider this. If the rest of Jerusalem, not only the church, not only the Christian church, but if the rest of Jerusalem, if all of those temple-going Jews of, of that day in Jerusalem had heard that Peter, one of the main leaders of the Christian movement, had gone and witnessed to and been in fellowship with a Gentile Roman soldier, there would have been a riot. There's no other way to say it. Deaths would have occurred. The church had already seen its share of trouble, its share of martyrs. Uh, chapters back, that had happened. Uh, Stephen and others preaching about Jesus. And what had happened then with the martyrdom of Stephen would have seemed trivial with what would have occurred against the church if the news of Peter's actions had gotten out. Peter's actions would have caused the Jewish population to act against the church in Jerusalem by banning, possibly even destroying, these who were involved. But, but wait, you're probably thinking, wouldn't God have protected those, those people? Wouldn't have God have protected the followers of Jesus just as God had previously done? After all, we're continually reminded that God will preserve a remnant of those who will live and preach God's truth to the world. For those of you who are thinking about God's protection, you are right. God always has and always will preserve God's truth. But would it be right for God to ignore the laws that God had given? That's the other side of that question. 
God had given his moral law. Was it right for Peter to ignore that moral law? Didn't some sort of divine justice need to be handed out to Peter for turning his back on what he knew the scripture said? This is, a, this is an argument that we can go back and forth on all day. So instead of doing that, let's move on. Let's move on to the second part here, the answer. I've already read you this long passage, and so I'm just going to refer to it again. It's going to be up there, I think. You're going, to, you're going to read it. But I just want to remind you of what it says there. Peter says, I had a vision. I had a vision of this sheet of, that represents all of creation that was lowered down, and it had birds and bugs and animals and fish and everything in there. And a voice from heaven said, Peter, take and eat. And I said, nah, I'm not going to do that. I've never put anything in my mouth before that would make me unclean. That reminds me of something that Jesus said. That what makes us unclean is not what goes into our mouth, but what comes out of our heart. It's not what goes into our bodies that makes us unclean. It's what comes out of our mouths because of what's been placed in our minds and in our hearts by what we have participated in. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. Oh, be careful, little ears, what you hear. Peter says, no, God, no, I'm not going to do that. And the voice came back and he said, don't, don't call unclean what I have called clean, what I have made clean. Peter said this happened three times. And he said these folks showed up. And they said, we need Peter to come with us. And I said, okay. And so I went, and I ended up at Cornelius' house. And Peter goes on, and he gets to the very end of this, verse 17. And he tells them, he says, what was I supposed to do? As I preached, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, just as it had fallen upon us on the day of Pentecost. How could I deny that God was here and working. If, verse 17, if therefore God gave them, the Gentiles, the same gift of the Holy Spirit as he gave to us, we who are eyewitnesses to the fact of Jesus Christ and his life and his death and his resurrection, if they received what we received from God, how could I possibly argue? How could I withstand God? This story became so important to the early church that Peter retells it several times throughout the book of Acts. What God reveals in this vision redefines the relationship between the church and those Gentiles, those who are outside of Judaism. There continued to be an argument for years that before you could become Christian, you had to become Jewish. That before you could accept Jesus Christ, you first had to accept the covenant that God had given to Abraham way back in Genesis. That you had to become a child of Abraham by faith before God could make you a child through faith in Jesus Christ, a child of God through faith in Jesus Christ. That was the argument. But what God reveals in this passage of Scripture redefines all of this. While there were some examples of God-fearing Gentiles responding to God's voice and choosing to follow Jesus before Acts chapter 10, God has just given the church permission for the church to enter a brand new field of harvest. While the principles behind the moral law that we find in the Old Testament didn't change, God still tells us who follow Jesus to be cleansed from the pollution of sin and sinning by remaining in relationship with God through Jesus. The understanding of who was allowed to hear and to respond to God's voice did change. (laughs) God declared all of humanity open to the proclamation of the gospel. Suddenly, all of that understanding that God created humanity in God's own image, suddenly that made sense. Wait, if all of humanity is created in God's image, then all of humanity has the opportunity to respond when God speaks. 
the cultural boundaries between Jew and Gentile, between male and female, between rich and poor, all of that was overcome by the grace and the love of God demonstrated through the cross to all who will believe. That's, Paul, that, that's Peter's answer. And then verse 18 tells us the final part of this section, the acceptance. When they heard these things, they became silent. They no longer fought with Peter. And they glorified God. Instead of their, their, their energy going into an attack on Peter and continuing to jump to conclusions regarding Peter, their energy now went into glorifying and thanking God. And they said, then God has also granted, in the Greek it can be written this way, God has also granted even to the Gentiles repentance to life. Here we finally find the conclusion that we talked about earlier. The conclusion was that God's redemptive work was only for the Jewish people, for those who were descendants of Abraham, for those who had inherited the promises of the covenant that God made with Abraham. Not only does God allow for a meal to be shared between Jew and Gentile, now God has opened the way for Gentiles to become a part of God's kingdom through trusting Jesus. So now it's not only one meal. <laughs> it's the meal in heaven. It's the, the heavenly banquet. is open to us because we're Gentiles. It's open to us as well. The covenant God made with Abraham hasn't been ignored. <laughs> it's been completed by being opened to include Abraham's spiritual descendants and not only Abraham's physical descendants. God had to correct this way of exclusionist thinking in these church leaders in Jerusalem. The salvation offered by God's grace and love is not limited by any cultural boundaries, but is extended to anyone who will hear and respond to God. Here in Jerusalem, in Acts chapter 11, we are finally seeing the church getting a glimpse of the bigness of God's love and grace. And their response? They glorified God. Because they were amazed amazed that God could love even these. Which conclusions do we jump to when it comes to presenting God's truth to the world? Over the years, some have convinced themselves that only people who look like me, only people who live in my neighborhood, are worthy to receive the good news that God has defeated the power of sin. God, if that idea has crept into our minds or spirits here in this church. Forgive us, God. The good news of God's victory over sin is still available to all who will receive and respond to that good news. How do people hear this news? <laughs> Through us. We are the instruments. We, right here, each of us, we are the instruments God has chosen to take this message out to the world. Through us, we who have witnessed God's work of redemption in our own lives, this message is lived and preached. We can't make anyone believe. That's not our job. But our job is to go and to preach with our lives, with our words. What we have heard, the world needs. What God has given to us through Jesus is to be shared with others and not only held on to for ourselves. And as we go, God defends what God has given. God had to show the Jerusalem church that it was time to stop jumping to conclusions about God's activity and God's will. It was time to go. It was time for the church to share with the world that God's amazing act of grace and love was available to all who would listen and receive it. Will we listen? If we will listen, then we will hear God directing us still to go and to live a 
as God's witness. Amen and amen. As we conclude this morning, we turn again to song. I invite our musicians to come up and let's sing again together. Our benediction this morning comes from the very last book, at the very last verse, rather, of the book of Jude. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and forever. Amen. Let us pray. God, these words, help them to echo in our, in our minds, in our spirits, as we leave this place, as you send us away from here. Father, you've equipped us today. You've prepared us. You've given us a message to preach with words, with actions. As we go into this world this next week, Father, Help us not to be dismayed, not to be distracted, but fill us, Lord God. Again, fill us with your power. Proclaim through us, Lord God, your might, your good news, your victory. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity this morning to hear and to respond to your voice. Go with us now. In Jesus' name, amen. Because one, Lord, because one, Holy Spirit, make us one. Let your love flow 
so the world will know we are one in you. Amen. You're dismissed.